Hey guys, thanks for clicking this. You're about to watch the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I've survived over 5,500 days in my main hardcore world, in which I only slept for about 60 times very early on. But for this particular challenge, I took it to another level. In this video, I survived hardcore Minecraft for 100 days without sleeping in game and in real life. That is 33 hours of recording over 43 hours of staying awake to do it. So I played Minecraft for a day and a night and a day again deep into the night once more. That's not all there is to it though. I also made a really awesome world for you guys. If you watch till the end of the video, you'll find out what I managed to do during this grueling challenge and I'll leave you with a special gift. If you end up liking the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It's free and you can always take it back. Enjoy the video. The plan for this video is to go as hard as I can while still being careful enough not to die. That means that there's no time to cower in caves, because by the end of this challenge I want to have a really cool base and we're going to save time by heading straight to the end and getting our diamond gear there. On day one, I started out by punching a tree, getting some stone, crafting all my tools and then I immediately took to the sea. I feel that this warm ocean could be an indication that we also have a desert in the area. I honestly don't entirely know whether that is how terrain generation works, but logically it makes sense, right? So it, it should, I guess. Maybe. Minecraft free, please. While boating over a coral reef, I found a shipwreck, which I looted, followed the map, dug up the treasure, and then went looking for a desert, because it was an essential part of my plan. I want to try and carry my first wooden pickaxe to, uh, to the end of the game, because I, I've never saved that. Oh, let's actually take the shield. Water bucket, is there any food we have that we don't need to cook? Oh, there's cooked salmon! Look at that. Didn't expect that. That's a village. And the next priority, finding a desert temple. And surviving the night. Because we are gonna get mob spawns in a minute. What's over there? There are ruins. Don't care so much about them. I would have cared about a ruined portal. That I would have definitely checked out. And I think we don't want to be right. There we go. Oh! Lots of food! I'm gonna skip out on the pork chops because I feel we got enough food variation and we don't want to waste inventory space for food that we don't need. So let's check out the portal chest. Doesn't look like a good place to set up a actual... Never mind. There's enough lava to make it work, of course. Bane of arthropods. Oh! I'm breaking, why not? So we could set up a nether portal here using lava buckets. Our gear, yeah. Ooh. I spent the rest of the day getting food, finding a village, collecting beds and hay bales, and I finished the day off by cooking all my food while I looted this desert temple for gunpowder. That gunpowder was super important, and this first day was really quite eventful. I had crossed a lot of things off my list already, and I was ready for some big moves on day two. On the second day, I found another village where I got more hay bales and killed another iron golem. Then I made my way back to a ruined portal I found earlier where I accidentally messed up making a nether portal. Oh no, are we literally one short now? Luckily, I could find the one lava source I missed in a nearby cave, so I made my way into the nether, where I spawned into a very weird enclosed area I had to dig my way out of. That led me into a warped forest, where I got my first ender pearl, and right after that moment, I spotted a bastion behind the warped forest. I had to make a call whether I was going in or not. I decided that I was only going to try this challenge once, so going into a bastion was a risky call. Still, I felt like it was going to be worth it if I just took it slow. Right before the end of day two, I set foot on some blackstone bricks as we got the those were the days advancement. Before heading in, I went back outside, got a lava bucket and a bunch of netherrack to get ready for the bastion. I was quite terrified of piglin brutes while heading in, but the first two just jumped off a bridge, so I didn't really have to bother with them. Guys, what up? How was that the play? I really don't hear any brutes. I'm aware that this is not the effective strat, but I don't care about the effective strat. I just want a somewhat strafe, safe strat. There's gonna be chests up top. Let's go for that as well. So I don't know where the gold blocks are to be found in this one. Oh, I was sort of hoping to immediately find a uh, fortress as well. Not quite that lucky. Okay, we got a treasure room over here. Can we get rid of him? I feel like he's absolutely stuck. Okay, nice. There's another one coming. Okay, dude, you're a little bit scary right now. We got another brute here. We can make brute toast out of him. That's good. Okay. Any of them can get here now. Uh, what else do we get here? 
not banner pattern. Cool, but not very useful. Obsidian could be useful. String, I don't think we need that much. All right, I feel like there's another treasure room here. There is. Same slow approach. Okay, another one took the dive. So scared, so terrified. Gold block, useful. Oh! Yes, I will definitely take that. Nice. So now we got a wooden pickaxe and pig stab to hold on to. Okay, wait, I feel I feel like we could um, could find some gold blocks in the wall here. I honestly don't exactly know where they are. This is just me investigating because I saw a random clip of somebody mining in a bastion. But I honestly have no idea where to go. So I no, this is not gonna work. So we got two gold blocks and pig stab so far. I think this is the best one too for gold blocks. The remainder of day two and most of day three was spent in the bastion as I slowly made my way around, burning brutes, looting chests, and gathering some stray gold blocks. Because I had never studied bastion routes, I knew there were probably gold blocks on the back of the bastion, but I didn't know where exactly. So when I eyed option two in the middle of the bastion, I decided to do the scary thing and work my way down to a vulnerable position. All the magma cubes around me stressed me out big time, so to make sure I didn't die here, I made a tunnel that shielded me from magma cubes and piglins before I started collecting the main bastion treasure. The craziest thing I found here was a looting three diamond sword. Just listen how I reacted to finding that. Holy! Oh my goodness! Looting three? Only during editing the video, I realized that sword had me so excited that I just straight up wow. forgot to take the diamond pants and helmet out of the chest. Stress of all the magma cubes was real and me not taking this armor would come back to haunt me later in the end. Dumbest play I've seen myself do in a long time. I'm actually really curious what enchantments were on the pants too. For now, I had to soldier on with my leather pants and iron helmet. Once I had all the gold blocks, I made my way out through the tunnel and then entered the bastion in the same place as before to find some piglins to trade all the gold with that I had just stolen from under their noses. Okay, we got, we got the soul speed boots going on. The main thing I need here is fire rest though. That, that's what I'm in. On day 4, I got out of the bastion with all the ender pearls, fire rest potions and obsidian blocks that I needed. Most of that day was spent trying to find my way around the nether in search of a fortress. But once I found one, it didn't take a lot of time at all because of the looting sword. I needed 6 blazes to get 12 rods, which would be enough not just for the end portal, but also for any potions I might need later. And right before the end of day 4, I hopped back into the overworld through a portal I made right next to that blaze spawner. Okay, let's do this. How far out are we? 1822. Day 5 was spent walking a good distance through the overworld in search of the stronghold, which I mined into an hour and 37 minutes after starting the world. Not a speedrun by any measure, but a really decent start to this 100 day challenge. I like the pace so far, but the scariest moments of the entire run were right in front of me as I set up a bed and a chest, popped the eyes into the portal, and jump through right at the beginning of day six. Bo, let's do this. As soon as I set foot in the end, I realized that I hadn't done an ender dragon fight in months leading up to this challenge. I really should have given this a few practice runs, but this was it. I was an hour and 40 minutes into the challenge and I had to survive this fight. High ones can be tricky. I'm not gonna mess with the ender dragon right now. I'm just gonna try and focus and get all the crystals out of the way. I think that might be the last one. Oh no, there's still one there. Perfect. I could go beds or I could just shoot her down, which is slower, but a lot more, a lot safer. I'm still tempted to use a bed though. We're gonna have to try it. Does so much more damage. Just gonna have to be really careful. I figured the best chance I had was using the beds I brought and just being careful while placing them. But I got launched on the very first attempt. Tried to pearl my way down, but still had to land the water bucket to save my life there. Then six 
seconds later, the pearl landed. That's how long the pearl took? Oh my. I don't know if I'm ready to do that again. Oh, that was scary. This whole fight was turning into something very scary. On my next approach with the bat, I decided against it. I had 41 arrows in my inventory and I was just going to chip away at her hit points, one arrow at a time. Before I could fire a single one, I got launched again because of bad positioning. Again, the water bucket saved me and I started just sniping the dragon and bringing her health down. Then the arrows ran out and I had to go for the bats again. So apparently playing it safe is also scary. I really should have practiced dragon fights before doing this. Oh, we're out. Oh my goodness. No more arrows. No way of getting more arrows. We're gonna have to do it. Got the first one. Misplaced the second one. One more bed. It's literally one more bed. The third bed was a hit. Yes! When I heard that sound of the dragon kill, I was so relieved. It was unreal. I quickly went back to the overworld to get some wood and a crafting table that I would need in the outer end regions. I also decided to run through the stronghold for a couple minutes to look for creepers. Giving myself five minutes just to look for creepers because of the impact it would have on how far we can venture into the end. Oh yes! Never been so happy to see creepers. <laughs> Even more surprising, never been so happy to see creepers in a stronghold! With the looting three on my sword, I could get some extra gunpowder before going end city raiding. That would help me get a few more end cities in my quest for loot and elytras. As I made my way through the end gateway, I got incredibly lucky because there was an end city right there, which may have easily saved me two or three game days. Um. No way! Oh yes! We are getting an elytra here. What's the strat? I think we're clearing the city itself. Clearing the city itself. And then we're purling onto the ship. Silvers are gonna do quite a bit of damage until we get our armor sorted. The focus is real. Day 7 started with me getting the city at the end of the game advancement. Now I have done a lot of end city raiding, so I'm quite comfortable here, but with crappy armor on, it is a completely different game. Remember when I said it would come back to haunt me that I did not take the diamond armor in the bastion? Well, here we were. The Shokers bullied me a ton. I got down to around four hearts a couple of times and I did a lot of levitating before I finally broke my way down onto the end ship. This next advancement though was honestly the biggest thing because the sky is indeed the limit from this point forward. I took off from the end ship and flew further out into the end. The rest of that day was spent finding my first pieces of diamond armor which made the Shulker fights a lot less intense. It was the end of the first week in game and I was crushing it. The next four days were spent flying further and further out into the end as I collected all the gear I would need for the rest of this challenge. During a 100 day challenge, I wasn't going to need a ton of sugar boxes, so I only cleared out the rooms in the end cities that had chests and kept flying out looking for more end cities to find additional diamond gear and elytras. After 10 days of surviving in the world, I took my first break from this massive grind. As I just moved into a new apartment, my sister and her boyfriend came to visit and check the place out. We ended up going out for lunch together and because it was nice to catch up, we stayed out for about an hour and a half. Good times honestly, but later in the afternoon I realized that was time that would come back to haunt me later because the more breaks I take during this challenge, the longer it will go on for. After I came back from that break, I continued my end city rating for a little while longer because it took me quite some time to find an exit portal. But once I found that gateway, on day 12, I hopped out of the end with all the gear I needed to combine a very decent set of diamond armor and tools. I was 12 days into the challenge and honestly had my gear nearly maxed out. That was a very, very decent start. 
I decided for this challenge, diamond armor was as high as I was going to go, because I didn't need anything more to be safe, and I want to focus on building a cool project over the course of these 100 days. With most of my gear out of the way, it was time for part 2 of the challenge. I wanted to make a cool base before we hit day 100, but before I could focus on that, I had to make sure that all my progress was sustainable. That meant I needed a way to repair my items and get any missing enchantments. So the next mission was getting a little bit set up in terms of storage and then building an enderman farm in the end. To make travel quick and easy, I was going to build my base right on top of the stronghold. The name for that project? Villa Insomnia. Day 13 was mostly spent organizing the crazy amount of loot I brought back from the end and combining different items to stack enchantments. I got very close to perfect gear, but to finish it up, I wanted to get that enderman farm up and running as quickly as possible, so I started mining stone and gathering leaves to get ready for construction. When I was just about done with the leaves on day 14, I realized that I was going to need a name tag for the endermite, because otherwise it would despawn. The best way to go out and look for that was to find a mineshaft. So I killed some creepers or gunpowder, took my sugar box with elytras, and made my way out to the ocean, looking for underwater ravines connected to cave systems. The reason I went looking in mineshaft was that if I could find a mineshaft, I would probably also find glowberries. And while I was at sea, I could look for moss blocks and shipwrecks. Those were all things I would definitely be needing later, so might as well get them now. Day 15 was one of the less successful days. I didn't really find what I was looking for, but I did come across some other things. I found melons in the village, pumpkins on a hillside, and I looted a few shipwrecks. But I couldn't find the moss blocks that I was hoping for. Right before the end of the day, I did find a desert temple that gave me three golden apples and a lot of gunpowder. Gunpowder is really important right now because I don't plan to build a creeper farm during this video and I do want to have plenty of rockets available for mobility. Looting three on the sword honestly helps a lot, but a little bonus from a desert temple really can't hurt us. On day 16, I found an underwater ravine which resulted in a fair bit of diamond ore, but unfortunately no connected mineshaft yet. I did find an amethyst geode, which I cleared out in case I want to use either the amethyst blocks or the calcite for my base later. I also ran into a bunch of mobs that got stuck in flowing water. Easy pickings. Day 17 still didn't get us a mineshaft, but I did find some icebergs and collected a shulker box full of ice just in case. Later on the day, I went into another cave system connected to a ravine. At this point, I started mining all the iron ore I found with my fortune 3 pickaxe because I realized that I might be looking for this mineshaft for a while. In that case, I want to get some resource while doing it and I joked around that I might be able to mine all the blocks I needed for a beacon. I'm trying to figure out whether it is worth it to mine a beacon. Because initially I thought I wasn't gonna do that. But with the new fortune on ores, it might be entirely possible. Early on day 18, the cave system I was in finally connected to a mine shaft. I found glowberries in a minecart chest and mined a lot more iron and other ore blocks. But there wasn't a name tag yet. Then day 19 came around and I finally found it! Five days after I left the stronghold to go on this quest, I had a name tag. It had taken just as long to find it as it had taken to get to the end from day zero. That is pretty wild. After finding the name tag, I didn't leave the cave system just yet because I realized that I had mined so much iron that the mining for beacon blocks was now absolutely in reach. When I started this challenge, I didn't think I was going to get a beacon at all, but I now thought that it would be worth it. So I went for it. I was going to get this world properly set up for you guys. On day 20, I was mining for iron and it wasn't a particularly eventful day, but I did start to run out of food. So on day 21, I used the bones I'd collected to farm some carrots on a makeshift farm in the mineshaft. I had gone so far outward to look for the mineshaft that I had to travel about half a day to get back home. But once I got there, the remainder of day 22 was spent organizing everything I needed for the Enderman farm, smelting up all the iron for the soon-to-be beacon, and before the day was over, I found myself bridging backwards over the void once more. But this time, I had a new light round. So if I accidentally slipped off, I would make it out just fine. Fear Factor was absolutely gone, and before we knew it, I had built out far enough to build a proper Enderman farm. Construction of the Enderman farm was actually really smooth and by the time day 23 was over I had built the entire farm 
spawned in the Endermite, named him... <coughs> uh, guys, take a hint here. Take a hint. Honestly, I would very much appreciate it if you join me on my journey as I try and make my main hardcore world Minecraft history. Guys, thank you very much for all hitting that subscribe button. You are awesome. Let us continue our story. At the end of day 23, I would be working on the top platform of the farm to create all the spaces for Endermen to spawn in, get angry at the Endermite, and jump down into our killing spot. Day 24, I was spent finishing the platform up top, getting rid of the bridge to the end island, flooding the leaves down in the killing area, and then finally making the most of the farm. Things got loud, but we now have an up and running Enderman farm! That is awesome. On day 25, I used the levels from the Enderman farm to combine some of the armor pieces and tools that were too expensive to combine from just the levels that I got from the dragon fight earlier. During the nighttime, I flew around to gather sugarcane for a small farm and I killed any creepers I saw on the way. With enough rockets to sustain myself for a little while, I went into the nether to try and get wither skulls. At this point, I hit a little bit of a wall. Even though I had looting on my sword, I couldn't get any wither skulls to drop. The main issue, I just couldn't find enough wither skeletons. I tried everything. Lower render distance to force despawn other mobs, flying out of the chunks, everything. But I couldn't get it to work. And my elytra durability started to wear out. At this point, I was nearing the end of 12 elytras worth of durability and I had to get mending for at least one of them. All in all, when I headed out of the nether on day 29, I had effectively wasted three days for no progress, and part of why that happened is that the fortress I tried to use for this had entirely too much spawnable blocks and not enough lava surrounding it. Reason I didn't go deeper into the nether? I had a problem with my elytra durability. So we had to fix that issue first before we tried all of this again. After the failed nether adventure, I took a couple minutes to set up some additional farms for carrots and bamboo. Building automated farms for these currently isn't worth it because the time pressure of 100 days is pretty intense. It's a marathon if you do it in one go, but it's also not that long at all to build a Minecraft world. After the farms were set up, the main portion of day 30 was spent trying to convince this man to sell us something useful. I specifically wanted mending from him, which he sold us eventually for 38 emeralds. We got absolutely scammed, but it did fix my urgent problem and we had enough emeralds from the end raiding we did earlier to afford it. So I bought it anyway. Day 31 was spent at the Enderman farm to get a few unbreaking three books. With those, I enchanted the elytras that weren't broken yet and one of them got the mending book we got from the villager. The unbreaking books sort of solved my problem, but I decided that I want to take an extra step on day 32. I'm not a big fan of stealing villagers away from their homes, nor setting up villager breeders to build the ultimate trading setup. I mean, it's a pretty cool feature but it just doesn't match my feeling of the game. So I prefer to find every villager that ends up being a trader at the base as a zombie villager out in the wild and cure them. There's honestly no good reason for this other than it feels more rewarding. For all of day 32 and the daytime of 33, I cleaned and prepared the area where I was going to build my base soon. Then, when the sun went down, I started checking the area to see if any zombie villagers spawned in. When I was sure there were no zombie villagers, I flew way up high until the ground below was so far away that it got out of render distance and all the mobs despawned. Then I floated down slowly, making sure that only the blocks right underneath me are in spawning range and only those above ground. During that night, I repeated that trick over and over again, so I saw a lot of mobs, but unfortunately, none of those were zombie villagers. After the sunrise on day 34, I continued growing and harvesting spruce trees to get logs I would later need for the construction of Villa Insomnia. I did that all day until the sun started going down, and you know it, once more, I took to the skies. This time, it worked out, and I ended the night with not just one, but two zombie villagers. On the daybreak of day 35, I built a platform over their heads, and with the zombie villagers protected from sunlight, I went on a little mission to gather sand. Since I didn't even have the materials, to make three water bottles for potions of weakness. As the sand was smelting up, I decided to go into the nether for some crimson wood and nether ward blocks for the upcoming build, and the day was over before I knew it. Day 36 started with me building a dripstone farm for decorations later, which I honestly harvested a lot over the course of this 100 days, but will completely forget about during the final sleep-deprived hours of the challenge. So I never built anything out of dripstone. After the dripstone farm was done, I became a zombie doctor by curing the villagers and I destroyed a library to get books to trade with them. 
By then, night came around again, so I repeated my flying up high routine to try and get another zombie villager. That mission was a success, so on day 37 I put these three cured villagers in their trading cubicles and started cycling their trades. First one, I locked on sharpness 4 to upgrade my axe. Second villager gave me unbreaking 2 books for a single emerald, which I decided to take and combine into unbreaking 3 books. The third one got me mending for a single emerald. This entire process of getting the villagers in their cubicles, cycling their trades and combining armor took almost two days. On the plus side, while I was getting the books I needed and making bank off of books, the sugarcane had been growing the entire time. So I had both my electro durability and my firework supply fully under control now. On day 39, I went on to enchant and heal up all my elytras. Then I went back to the overworld to go creeper hunting during the night for some extra fireworks because I was preparing for a second attempt at getting wither skeleton skulls. I really want to set up a beacon, but I also didn't want to waste a ton of time, so I was going to give it one more shot of three game days to see if I could get the job done. Once daybreak of day 40 came around and there were no more creepers to get gunpowder from, I made my way back into the nether and kept flying in a straight line until I found a fortress that was largely surrounded by lava. Just like before, I turned the render distance way down to force mobs to spawn in the fortress area rather than the surrounding terrain, and very quickly, I got my first Wither Skull. I believed in getting the beacon again, and with 60 game days left before 100, I was sure we were going to actually benefit from getting it. Within the next two minutes, something absolutely crazy happened. I ran into four Wither Skeletons, who collectively dropped not one, but two skulls. That meant I had all three of them, and it was time to go back home and fight a Wither. Before heading out, I made a screenshot to save the location of the fortress, in case I want to find it back. But Thinking back on that now, I don't think there was any chance I was gonna go back here before day 100. So with a useless screenshot and three Wither Skulls in my backpack, I made my way back home. As the sun came up on day 41, I was about to fight the Wither for the first time in a world different than my main hardcore world. It felt like a bit of a moment, but at the same time, I've done this fight so many times on that world that it should be a breeze. The only thing was that I had never done it in the open world, out in the open. Even though it felt like a moment, the fight was honestly over before I knew it, and I got to set up the actual beacon. A thing I never even thought I would go do during this 100 day challenge was completed on day 41. With the beacon now in place, it was time to get the construction started. Building time. The first order of business was cleaning up the landscape above the stronghold a bit to create room for my project. Usually, my projects are quite big, but the individual buildings that are a part of the projects aren't. On this challenge, I set the goal for myself to make the biggest building that I could finish within 100 days. A giant house to call my home at the end of it, named Villa Insomnia. So I started frameworking the build, I laid out the biggest frame I could get away with on the plateau, that had cleaned up and built pillars on the front side to decide the height of the building facade. On day 43, I was happy with the general size of the framework that I put in place, so I decided to move on to something I really wanted to try my hand at. My main goal with the build is to make a cool interior, and I came up with something that could really define the entrance and give the build character. I had an idea to have the word insomnia written out on a decorative wall. Because of the design challenge that came with it, I figured it was best to start with this step while my brain was still somewhat functional and then later I could just build the building around it. At this point in time, it was already past 3 a.m. Sunday night or Monday morning depending how you look at it and I had to consider that somewhat down the line, I might not be the sharpest tool in the shed anymore. And truth be told, I was struggling a little bit already. So even though I managed to design most of the wall halfway through day 44, I had not managed to make it fit on the first try. That meant I had to redo it. But rather than taking down the entire thing, I placed it two blocks further forwards towards the entrance and copied the design I already made on a frame that was two blocks wider. Now I have an admission to make and I know that some of you guys are going to hate me for saying this, but the frame was actually three blocks wider because my tired mind already discounted by 3 a.m. Sunday night. The whole thing is and forever will be off center by one block and I wouldn't even notice it until around day 85. Still, I did manage to make the word look awesome. So on day 45, I finished the wall and got a good look from a little further out. This was exactly what I hoped to make. Designing letters in such a small space is hard enough by itself, but trying to give them character is a real challenge. And I was very happy 
with the way this looked. But I ran out of nether ward blocks, so I went into the nether to gather some more materials. In there, I found a lost zombie villager who I put in a boat to save later. There was a slight issue of having to build a bubble elevator on the other side to get him up to the villa, but I would address that later. For now, he was safe. On day 46, I finished the letters and added a layer of shroom lights on the bottom to light up the sign I made. The rest of that day was spent making support beams for the roof before I realized I want to light up the top of the sign as well. So on day 47, I went back into the nether to gather more shroom lights and some crimson wood, which I considered using for the roof. As I tried that out, I realized I didn't like it very much because the whole vibe felt too much like eggplants and not enough like a fancy mansion. So I took it down and tried again with some of the nether ward blocks that I had left over. That looked exactly like I wanted it to. So on day 48, I made my way back into the nether and collected a bunch of nether ward blocks for the construction of the roof. During this trip, the tire just got to me a little bit. So I checked my hotbar a ton to make sure I really had my armor on and a fire resistance potion in my hotbar. On day 49, I worked on a design for the main roof that I didn't like at all. I gave it a redesign and then scratched it all together to go for a different strategy. At this point, I was struggling a little bit because it was close to 6 a.m. on Monday morning and phantoms kept knocking me off the roof as I was trying to get my construction done during the night time. It led to a very rare occurrence of me being frustrated while playing Minecraft. That doesn't happen at all. My entire brain could not process me being repeatedly knocked off the roof and it really didn't help that I decided to stick with diamond armor over netherite. This is probably the moment that decision hurt me the most. But other than that, I really believe that it wasn't necessary for this challenge. On day 50, I decided to tear down the filled roof design in favor of a simpler shape that made a lot more sense for the proportions of the building. The phantoms were really getting the better of me now, so I decided to force a mental reset. On day 50, I quit my Minecraft, put my earbuds in and left the house to go walk outside for an hour and wake up a bit while the city woke up around me. That was the best decision of the entire challenge so far because after that walk, I felt a lot better and it allowed me to reset my headspace and get back into a motivated frame of mind rather than phantom bullying induced frustration. I was really stuck in it, it was a bad place. After collecting the ingredients for a fancy breakfast on the way back, I had a cup of coffee and sat down to continue the journey. Almost 8 a.m. Monday morning, with a surprisingly fresh and ready mind, considering that I was now awake for about 24 hours. Taking a step away was exactly what I needed, and that fresh mind allowed me to make a smart decision, which I think helped a lot in the long run. As the sun was coming up on day 51, I focused on getting the first whole roof segment in place. The goal was to have some of the area down below covered before nighttime would come around again, because if I had a roof over my head, I wouldn't have to struggle with the phantom attacks as much. While Snowstorm gave the roof some unexpected character that I really liked, I made some good progress on the construction and the build started to get some character because of it. As I was running out of netherward blocks, I made a little nylon platform to grow crimson trees on day 52. Once I had a couple stacks of block ready to go again, I continued shaping the roof some more on the sides by adding window frames. When nighttime came around, I kept the roof progress going, which meant the fences came around to mess with me once more. But the fresh mindset got me through it, and it helped a lot that I knew the phantoms wouldn't be as much of a problem a few days from now when the roof was completed. Day 53 was mostly spent getting the remainder of the netherworld blocks I needed for the roof. The good news was that the end was in sight as far as roof construction went. So as nighttime came around, I started designing the first details on the edges of the roof. On the 54th day of the world, the roof was starting to come together and I was almost ready to start working on walls and interior for Villa Insomnia. The phantoms were still bugging me because I tried to power through to the stage where I could could work while sheltered the entire time. I was missing more shots than I normally do when I try to fight them airborne, but I could still get it done just by experience. Day 55 was a turning point. I went down underground to get some cobble and I started designing the walls of the villa, which meant that we would soon be moving beyond just a frame of a building. And truth be told, it was about time. We were well over the midway marker and there is a ton of work left to do to make this place look like a finished build. On day 56, I went out for a resource run. I was going to use some stained glass in the build but I didn't have any sand laying around so I flew out to the desert I remember from my quest when I was looking for a mine shot. On the way there I also came across a jungle where I took some logs in case I wanted different wood colors for construction. When I had all the resources I flew back home and then in a way I saw the project for the first time. These are some of my favorite moments in building
building things in Minecraft. The point where it's just past the frameworking stage and I can envision what the build will look like or feel like when it's more completed. On this day, Villa Insomnia hit me hard and I was very excited about what it would end up like. On day 57, there was one more ingredient I would need for the windows of the villa. I had to collect some flowers from the nearby flower forest to get the different colors of dye I wanted to use. Unfortunately, I hadn't been able to find a Badlands biome on my mineshaft quest, so I wouldn't be able to use any terracotta in my build. The dye would have been great for that too, but we would have to make do with other blocks. When it turned to night, I first got to benefit from the roof overhead as I mined out the lower section of the villa on day 58. This was also the moment where the beacon saved us a ton of time. I couldn't imagine mining out an area like this without the beacon while feeling the time pressure of trying to complete a project within 100 days in Minecraft. Usually my projects take well over a thousand days, so this challenge was a real race against the clock for me. As my tools started to get low, I made a trip to the Enderman farm to restore their durability before getting right back to digging. Before day 59 was over, I had cleared out the entire lower section and I started building the walls. I did that all the way through to day 60. At some point during day 60, I quickly wanted to grab something from the storage, so I jumped down into the stronghold. Let's rewind this a little bit. This is where I had to go. But this is where I jumped down. I was very lucky here that this fall wasn't high enough to kill me, because this is exactly how this challenge could end. Like Tired Me remarked as well. I made a dumb sleeping mistake. Oh, goodness. Imagine that is how I die. It feels so bad. On day 60, as I was ready to take a break, I reflected on the progress I had made over the days before. And if we listen back to it, you can hear that A, I was having a pretty hard time at this point. But B, I got over a pretty rough speed bump. Let's listen to Sleep Deprived Looney for a minute as he talks us through the struggles he is going through at 11.26 a.m. on Monday morning. It is 11.26 Monday morning. The past hours have been the absolute hardest yet in terms of keeping focused, keeping the grind up, staying awake and not getting into a state of mind where I really don't get anything done. And I'm just wondering like, how, how am I going to make this project work in the time that I have left? But that being said, with that basement that we just cleared out and all the blocks ready to build everything in terms of the walls, I feel, let's not jinx it, I feel like there's uh, there's some excitement again. There's a feeling of we're making something cool and I kind of know where to go. So maybe, maybe I can uh, pull some energy out of this. <laughs> I'm definitely going to try. But guys, I got to be honest, this is, um, I, I completely underestimate how tough this is. After the break on day 60, I dug out another small room to make a little makeshift smelting room. As I was only going to smelt a limited amount of resources over the course of this challenge, I decided to not go with any auto smelter setups. It simply wasn't worth the time investment. As the furnaces smelted up the sand I needed for the stained glass, I put the walls for the villa in place. I wanted to be quick about it and I decided to just random place large surfaces and dig out the windows later. To get this done, I used a button on top of my mouse. It lets me disable scroll wheel resistance. This technique gives a little bit of extra texture and saves a ton of time because you don't have to plan the blocks. On day 62, I ran out of andesite, so I went down into the stronghold area down below and looked for a couple andesite veins. While I was down there, I decided to take down the library as well. Some of these bookshelves would be traded to the villagers as books and some of them would make great decoration for the villa interior. On day 63, I continued the construction of the walls until I ran out of andesite again and I had to do the whole cycle once more. You can see that I tend to get stuck in a loop of using a resource and then getting a little bit more, like with the nether ward blocks before. That's me trying to not collect a ton of resources that I don't really need to complete the project. Again, it is a race against the clock. As the sun came up for day 64, the walls were finished enough to start thinking about some detailing. The building was coming together, but to bring it alive, we needed to address some of the biggest flat wall surfaces. I started out by adding two balconies to the front to add a little bit of depth to the building's facade. On day 65, I did the same thing on the back of the building. Simply cutting up the largest flat surfaces into multiple smaller sections can honestly help a lot. We would still add windows, window frames and some other details later, but cutting up the large surfaces now helps a lot with visualizing what it needs to look like later, as well as keeping track of how much work still needs to be done on certain sections. 
On day 66, I started designing the layout for the interior of the villa. While I was working on that, my tired brain realized that I was actually busy with the balconies and I didn't finish them. So I went back and built the supports for those. I always try to make sure that when I'm building something, I design it in a way that it would at least have a small chance to not collapse on itself if it was an actual IRL structure. Building supports helps a lot to make a building feel like it could actually exist. At the end of the day, those balconies were supported and decorated, so I couldn't forget about it later. Day 67 saw the top floor being placed and a netherboard field harvested and replanted. After smelting some netherrack, I could build the main stairs going into the lower part of Villa Insomnia. There I dug a hole in the middle of the room that would be decorated as an indoors pond, which the rest of the room would be centered around. When the pond was dug out, I started replacing the edges with crimson logs on day 68, until I realized that I want to have some magma on the bottom to create bubbles in the water. I went into the nether and flew around looking for magma patches to dig out. I've used a lot of magma as a decorative dim moody light source before, so I took some extra blocks while we were out there. This is something I really like. On day 69, I managed to fill the entire pond with water. Nice. It honestly felt really good to be decorating the room. I believed that I was going to manage turning the interior into something exciting. A small downside was that the bubbles were only visible when I was in the water myself, which kind of defeated the purpose, but it still looked cool to have different light source blocks on the bottom. To blend the pond into the room around it, I want to make a red nether brick transition. So I harvested the field again, and when the circle was fully in place, I flew out to the nearby coral reef to get some decorative blocks, coral fans, seagrass, and kelp for the pond. By the end of the day, it already looked really cool. On day 71, I thought it was a good idea to put two axolotls in the pond. I had never seen one die on magma blocks, so I thought they were probably immune to magma damage. I was wrong. When I started here, Hearing that they took damage, I decided to keep an eye on them and somehow assumed that they would still survive the damage because they would go into their stone state to regenerate health. All of those assumptions were completely wrong and I was responsible for two axolotls who died in my aquarium from hell. RIP. On day 72, I finished up the edge of the pond and went out to gather leaves for the next part of the room decoration. Before I could actually move forward on that, I had to figure out the layout of the rest of the room. Specifically, I needed to put the first floor in place as well as the stairs that would lead up there. So on day 73, I built two giant pillars up from the floor all the way past the first floor to the top of the main room. The stairs around the pillars immediately worked, which was quite a win because sometimes these things take a rework to figure it out. In this case, I immediately had what I needed. With the stairs in place, I went down to what was still my storage room down by the end portal to get materials for the chains. On day 74, I put chains in place to suspend the first floor from the stone ceiling above it. Then I built a chain bridge on which I put the leaves hanging down to the pond below. This needed a couple reworks because I couldn't get the look right at first, but eventually I managed. The main challenge was actually hiding away some planks in between the leaves to suspend the glow berries from, which added a really cool feature to the look. By the time day 75 came around, I had figured out the hanging leaves and I started working on a floor pattern with stairs to put lines of water going outwards toward the walls. The room was coming along really well and I was locked in again. It seemed like I was going to make it to day 100 with a really cool completed project. And then I made a classic sleepy mistake that could have very well cost me the world. In a distracted moment, a creeper jumped on top of me while I had my chest plate and my offhand. That is what the blast protection on the pants is for. Whew. After surviving that creeper drive bomber, I ran into this guy who sold me the one thing I still haven't been able to get on my main hardcore world. Drip leaves. Truth be told, I would have rather gotten it on the other world, but I was definitely not going to pass up on this deal. On day 76, I experimented with drip leaf mechanics because I had literally never seen these in the Minecraft world yet. Once I had a bunch of it, I decorated around the pond in the center of the room. This place started to look really cool. As the day went on, I dug out a room on the side of the main hall to build a melon farm for villager trades. On day 77, the interior building started to really speed up, which was good because I was starting to shift my frame of mind to finishing the project. I was really struggling with my energy levels at this point, but there was almost eight hours of gameplay left to grind out. From experience, I knew that I was closing in on the point in time where the entire intelligent part of my brain was going to shut down completely. So every design feature that needed some actual brain capacity had to be done ASAP. By the end of the day, the entire first floor was in place and I was working on the arches that had to support the weight of the first floor hanging from the chains. On day 78, I finished up the arches in the interior 
And then I went outside for another break and some fresh air. When I came back to sit down and continue, I made the classic mistake of not pressing record while I continued construction on the first floor. So we have to skip the remainder of day 78, all of day 79, and a little bit of day 80. Until we get to pick up the progress in the later stages of me constructing the Villa Insomnia library on the first floor. I love how this room has a very defining bright red wall, which is actually the back of the Insomnia letter frame. That wall literally looks awesome twice. There was still a giant hole on the upper levels of the villa though. So to fix the visual lines from down by the entrance, I made a couple of spruce wood arches on day 81. This construction involved a lot of me climbing up and down to make sure it looked exactly like I wanted it to from down below. The perspective from the entrance of the villa was my main priority. Before the day was over, I had not only made the arches, but also the staircases and walkways that provided access to the highest levels of the villa. On day 82, I turned on shaders for the very first time during this entire challenge to take a look at what we had achieved so far. And I was honestly really excited with the progress because Villa and Somnia looked magnificent and really stood out from the area around it. Netherwork block roof was such an awesome color and I remember this moment. I remember the smile I had on my face. But truth be told, that smile can't have been nearly as pretty as I imagined it. Given the fact that I was up for about 36 hours at this point, I probably looked like I was ready to take an audition as an extra for the new season of The Walking Dead. With that tired smile on my face, I spent day 83 building support pillars in the basement to break up the big flat surfaces that the walls were. That gave the room a more finished feel to it, but also meant I had to do some covering up on the floor above. Bookshelves here, lantern there, and nobody will know that there's a pillar sticking through the floor. Completely worked, nailed it. To complement the melon farm, I built a pumpkin farm on the other side of the same room. Again, no automated farms, there's no point as we just have 17 days left in the challenge. On day 84, I dug out yet another room off of the main hall to turn into a storage room. I got a couple chests set up and then went down to the stronghold portal room to collect all the resources from down there. At this moment, my tired brain had a surprisingly bright thought. I realized that A, sorting chests would be a terrible thing to do as tired as I was, but B, if I give you guys a world download, my storage sorting is probably not going to make any sense to you. So I sorted some of the stuff I really needed for the construction that I still wanted to complete and left the rest for you guys to organize. Have fun, see how I did that? Late on day 85, I realized that I still desperately needed a moss block from a shipwreck. So I brewed up some night vision potions and I headed out. After I found the moss blocks I needed, which actually went really smooth, I spotted some creepers on land and I decided to hunt them down for gunpowder. At this point in time, my tired brain pulled a amazing trick on me. I was out hunting creepers, but it was light outside. Since it was raining, I thought it was a thunderstorm, but there was no lightning at all. Four whole minutes later, I was still absolutely fascinated by the fact that there were mobs spawning in all around me, even though it was light. As I was getting ready to accept the fact that I was witnessing some rare game-breaking glitch, I saw the sun come up. And I realized that I was using night vision. GG brain, you are killing it. Sleep deprivation is dangerous to you and others around you. Also, it can get you killed in hardcore Minecraft. Sleep responsibly. On day 86, I took my moss blocks home and set them aside until a couple days later while I gave the entrance of the villa a fancy look with all the extra diamond armor sets I got from my end rating early on. I missed a couple pieces to balance out the entrance, so I made a quick trip to the Enderman farm where I put some random level 1 enchantments on diamond helmets just for the looks. Some dragon hats to top it off and we had a very stately entrance. The next day, the great moss trend transformation happened. While I was looking for wither skulls early on I had taken a couple bone blocks from a soul sand valley that came in very useful as I transformed the area surrounding Villa Insomnia from the dark grayish green that comes with a spruce forest to the much more lush color of moss and azalea. A speedy transition with a massive impact on the feel of the area. On day 88 I gathered some leaves to detail the outside walls of the villa. At this point in time, my brain was very much falling apart. And my main goal was to just make it through the last four hours of the challenge. It was almost midnight on Monday, a solid 39 hours after I first begun this challenge. Still awake, but barely. That meant that I was shifting to doing things that needed a lot less brain capacity, while I tried to make the most of the bright moments that still came around occasionally. Since I didn't really have the energy to sort materials anymore, I decided to build a small roof over these construction chests before I started my effort to cover the area behind the villa and crops for a better look of the surrounding area. I realized that I still needed to move the villagers to a more permanent location, but I didn't really have the energy to figure out moving them. So on day 89, I decided to build an extra building on the side of the villa where they would live for now. It wasn't great, but it was better than a hole in the ground. After the villagers were covered up, I started planting wheat fields until I realized I wanted to get banners on the villa, which meant I had to get a small setup with some sheep to share. So I took a bundle of wheat and lured a flock of sheep all the way back 
to the villa. On day 90, I worked on a sheep pen inside the villa to get access to enough wool to make all the banners I needed. While the sheep ate their bellies full and regrew their wool, I planted as many crops as I could over the course of the day. Crop fields are a great way to make an area look cool, but it takes quite a big area to get the visual impact I was looking for. So even though I was tired, I tried to move as fast as I could. With another day getting away from us, I realized that I had to start setting priorities and getting the villager building sort of sort of was a big one. This hole in the ground wasn't going to work. So I got back to work and finished it. Truth be told, it really isn't my best work, but at the end of day 91, we had a roof. During the night, I kept planting crops, which got a little busy with mobs spawning around every now and then. Still, I tried to keep the progress coming as well as I could. On day 92, I had collected enough wool to hang the banners from the villa. They would have honestly looked a lot better if I would have taken the time to set up a loom and put some banners on there, but I think you guys understand how much I was running on fumes by now. I was literally aiming for every next day as a milestone on the way to the end goal. Small bite-sized goals were the only thing I could still manage. The next day I realized there was one small goal that I had still missed. The smelting room looked terrible with furnaces just slammed onto the wall so I decided I wanted to make something special out of it. I looked for a surprising block combination and came up with a rather funky design. A surprising room that I really enjoyed. On day 94 I decided that I had reached the home stretch. There were just two more hours of gameplay left and I got them done in a final stretch marathon. Last four hours of the challenge, I didn't take a break anymore. I could see the finish line and I wanted nothing more than get it over with and go to bed. I still tried to latch onto any moment where I had a sudden surge of energy to get something useful done. So on day 94, I fixed the roof of the villager building up a bit in between all the crop plants. On day 95, they got some basic interior for the room as well. After which I got back to planting crops for the remaining four days. Then on day 99, I realized that there was one essential thing that needed to be done. For everything to be perfectly balanced, I had to get to level 69. Same as in the Looney Adventure world. With that last thing out of the way, I took the dragon egg from the island, put it on display in the library on day 100 and did a quick tour of the world. That tour was honestly terrible. So instead, I'll give you some cool shots of everything I made while we listen to me after 43 hours of being awake to grind out 33 hours of playtime in a fresh hardcore world. This Ladies and gentlemen, is what a satisfied but broken Minecraft maniac sounds like when he reaches his goal while simultaneously being so tired that he has no idea where in the room his microphone exactly is. Before we go to that, I want to encourage you to watch the final two minutes of the video because at the very end, I have a really awesome present for you guys. I actually really, really like this build. It's right there. Insomnia. Very dramatic entrance at this place. Aquarium here. The staircase going up. I just realized that me and my tired brain didn't finish the uh, staircase. I'm I'm so like not even. But if we squeeze through here, I I do no way. Got the balcony here. She has a pretty cool view. Didn't finish the railing here either. Better is there. Go around this way. Two balconies. Front here. Finished. These ones get decorated. Why is there a creeper there? Two creepers. That's pretty serious. Oh, they're in the same, uh, same room. Just look at this place. Oh, this is like a face. I love it. It's like a cat with ears as well. It's beautiful. It also happens to be perfect with horizon there. You got mobs here as well. And a maxed out sword on A24. It's also pretty. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. It was honestly the hardest thing I've done in my life, but it was also a fascinating battle with my mind. I was so determined to get the job done 
And not only did I manage to stay awake, but I did a crazy amount of work, which I'm really proud of. As a little present, there's a world download below in the description. Enjoy it. I hope you, uh, you have a good time on this world. Maybe, maybe you can make it something that I couldn't do yet and take it from here. Enjoy. Love you guys. Looney out.